right, let's get the show on the road. Hello, everyone. Hope you're well. Welcome to another edition of Math 1203. Um, we will jump into it since we were in the middle of a topic last time. Here you can see my screen. Now you can see the chat. So last time we started talking about uh, maximum and minimum values. We wanted to get a little bit more general than we were uh, than we had it before. Um, so we defined what the absolute max and the absolute min was, the local max and the local min. Um, absolute max just means you're the biggest guy on a global scale on the entire interval that you're considering, uh, while absolute minimum means that you're the smallest guy on the entire interval. Um, as opposed to being local maximums or minimums, where you're just the smallest guy, well, you're the biggest guy or the smallest guy, respectively, in your little neighborhood, in a little, tiny little interval surrounding the point. So we define those things. Um, also I told you about another name for uh, max and min points, which are extreme points, plural extrema. Couple of important theorems to know. Uh, if your function is continuous on a closed interval, it's guaranteed to attain an absolute max and an absolute min on that interval. And Fermat's theorem, which says, uh, if you know you're at a local max or min and the derivative exists, then it must be zero. Um, the converse is not true. So just because your derivative is zero does not mean you have a max or min, uh, as well as if your derivative is undefined, it's possible for you to have a max or min. This led us to the notion of a critical point where we kind of say, well, all right, the possible candidates for maximums or minimums are where the derivative is zero or undefined. Um, and we just have to check it because we don't know for sure. Um, now, when it comes to finding extrema, we already know how to find the local ones via uh, the first derivative test. Um, so that's not gonna change, you already know that. Uh, but for the absolute uh, extrema, uh, we will find uh, them via what we call the closed interval method. Uh, so if F is continuous on a closed interval, we can find the global extrema by doing the following. Um, you find all the critical points, evaluate your function at those points. Um, like I said, people say critical points when they mean critical numbers or whatever, so we're good. Uh, you will evaluate the function at the end points because it's possible for the absolute max or min to occur at the end points. This actually happened in some examples earlier. Uh, so in, the, in this example, absolute min occurred at the end points. In this example, absolute max and min occurred at the end points, et cetera. So it's possible to, for these guys to occur at end points. So we're gonna come uh, evaluate the function at the endpoints. Then you're just gonna compare. The largest value is going to be your absolute max. The smallest value is going to be your absolute min. And that's it. I left you with an example um, to try. And uh, hopefully you tried it. So we are going to do that. We're gonna start with that example. And this is another problem in which um, if it shows up on a test or a quiz, it's not really going to be stated any other way. It's going to be very direct. Um, so this is going to be somewhat like uh, me asking you to find average rate of change or me asking you to use linear approximation to approximate some number. Um, so it's just gonna be straightforward. Hey, use linear approximation to do this. Hey, find the uh, average rate of change to do this. Similarly, um, for this kind of problem, I'm just gonna give you a function and say, hey, find the absolute extrema on this interval. Right, so it's going to be like directly asked. You don't really need any huge uh, word problem things to know. Um, someone's coming in here. Uh, no. I thought I'd copied that question. Oh well, we'll do it now. Hmm. 
Okay, so that is the problem. So we're going to go do the closed interval method. Uh, so first of all, uh, So first of all, uh, just note F is a polynomial. So it is continuous everywhere. In particular, it It is continuous on minus one three. Uh, this means um, this means uh, by the extreme value theorem that F has both an absolute max and absolute min. So we know it's possible to find these. Um, what, what, what did you guys get for the absolute max and min? Any guesses? What did, what did we get? So no one tried it, so we don't know. Okay. Uh, so the first thing we want to do is find the critical points. Okay. So to find the critical points, we're going to find f prime. f prime is equal to four x cubed minus eight X and four critical points. You're gonna set four X cubed minus eight X equals zero or undefined. It's never undefined, it's a polynomial. So we end up having to solve this equation, um, which Right, that's an algebra problem. Uh, common term is 4x. So you'd have x squared minus 2 um, when you factor that out. So you end up with three possibilities x equals 0, x equals radical 2, x equals minus radical 2. Now, what you want to do is you want to check, uh, test the critical points. Uh, however, you want to be careful. Uh, because you only need to te test the critical points that are in the interval. So let me mention, I'm pretty sure. Da, da, da. Yeah, find all critical numbers in the interval. So you'll notice that this guy is not in the interval. Um, radical two is like 1.4 ish. Um, it's, if I have negative 1.4, that is outside that interval because minus one, uh, negative one is the smallest value there. Um, three is larger than radical two. It's also larger than zero. Zero and radical two fall into that interval. So those are the ones I would test. So then I'm going to just be like, all right, so spine f of zero, which I think is zero. Right. And then I'm going to find f of radical two. And that's x to the fourth, 4x four squared. Okay. I'm going to start getting annoyed scrolling up and down. Let me pull up the questions somewhere else.
So it's x to the fourth. Uh, so that's radical two to the fourth minus four times radical two squared. Uh, so the fourth power is just the square and then you square the square. So you just square twice. Square radical two once, you get two. Square that twice, you get four. Um, and that's eight minus four. Okay, that's it. Two, uh, you want to test endpoints. So you're simply going to find, evaluate the function at the endpoints, which are minus one and three. So you're going to find f of minus one, and you're going to find f of three. So f of minus one, that's minus one to the fourth minus four times minus one squared. It's one minus four, it's minus three. And f of three, it's going to be three to the fourth minus four times three squared. Um, that is going to be, I can factor out a three squared, that'll be nine minus four, nine times five, 45. Um, yeah, so we have that. Now you move to step three, we're going to compare. So we look at all the y values that we found up to this point. And we want to pick out uh, the largest one and the smallest one. So if you notice here, the largest, well, the largest is going to be this 45. And the smallest is going to be minus four. And so you can now make the statement that uh, the absolute max is, um, f of three equals 45. And the absolute min is f of uh, rad two equals minus four. And that's your answer. So yeah, that's it. Uh, hold on. That's an absolute max and min problem. Um, nothing much to do there, actually. Um, so yeah, that's it. Um, I'm not sure did I want to. Um, so here, you can. Uh, illustrate for you what's going on here. So we have So if I were to graph this guy, um, so I'm graphing uh, y equals x to the fourth minus 4x squared. Well, that's just x squared times x squared minus 4. This is x squared times x minus 2, x plus 2. Um, so I know that there are three uh, intercepts. So there's one at minus 2, there's one at 0, and there's one at 2. Uh, this means x equals 0, x equals minus 2, x equals 2 are uh, 
those zeros. And then uh, remember how you graph, you can just uh, plug in a random number in between and just test them. So I can plug in a minus three, can plug in a minus one, can plug in a one, can plug in a three. If I plug in a three into uh, the F, I can ignore the X squared because that's always gonna be positive. Uh, so if I plug in a minus three into the X minus two, I would get a minus five, so that's negative. If I plug in a uh, minus three into that, I would uh, into the x plus two, I would also get a negative. Negative times negative is positive. Positive means it's above the x-axis. Um, if I plug in a three, three minus two is positive, and uh, three plus two is positive. So that's again positive. It's above the x-axis. Now remember that. Uh, you could also do this by the end behavior. Uh, X to the fourth is an even power because the coefficient is positive. We know that both ends point up. If the coefficient was negative, both ends would point down. If uh, the po highest power was odd, one po side points up, one side points down. If the coefficient of the highest power is positive and it's odd, the right side would point up, the left side point down. We remember all this from pre-calc. Okay. Um, so we didn't even have to test the endpoints actually. We kind of knew that they had to go up in both directions. If I plug in minus one, um, minus one minus two is negative. Uh, minus one plus two is positive. Uh, if I plug in one, one minus two is negative. One plus two is positive. So these are negative. So the graph needs to be down here. So ultimately what your graph looks like is like a W. Now, technically, we know how to graph it from here. Now, on the interval we care about, uh, this guy just becomes, um, it's going to be from uh, minus one okay, so it's just going to be like uh, here that goes down to three is that minus one um, here it intersects at two here it intersects at zero and as you can see on the interval minus one to three, your absolute max is gonna be at three. And your absolute min uh, this was a little bit higher. I'm gonna show you guys how to check how deep uh, this thing goes later on. Don't worry, um, because I we know that at uh, minus rad two is where it would hit like the, the minimum. And so at minus one, it's higher than that somewhere. So it's over here. So this point here is going to be your absolute min. And uh, that is pictorially what's going on. Okay. However, we could identify these points without even knowing what the graph looks like, right? We still could use the closed interval method to know that's where the, the max and min would have occurred, right? So this here, is at uh, radical two comma minus three. And this part here is at three comma 45. And
So that's what was going on there. Uh, so yeah, nothing much, nothing much else to do here. This is the process. I don't really think we need another example. Um, so uh, prior to the next section though, there is some stuff I wanna teach you. Perhaps remind you, it's possible that you did this in, it's possible you did this in pre-cut, but you never used the language that I'm going to use here because chances are you didn't learn about limits in pre-cut. So um, let's actually do that. Uh, prior to the next section, we need to talk. about asymptotes. Okay. So uh, let's actually talk about asymptotes. What are asymptotes? Uh, fuzzy definition. You can recognize them by seeing it, but um, I just want to give you an idea of what's going on. Um, an asymptote. Asymptote is a curve, a graph uh, approaches as the x or y value approaches infinity plus or minus. Um, it is, and I should put that in a different line. It is possible for a graph to not have asymptotes. other than itself. Okay, so uh, you, we don't tend to think of things like polynomials as having asymptotes, for example, because the polynomial would itself be an asymptote. We often use polynomials as a measure of asymptotes for other curves. Um, so let's actually talk about this. So there are many kinds of asymptotes. We care about two of them specifically. Uh, these are one, something that we call horizontal asymptotes. This means the curve the ward, the curve the graph tends toward is a horizontal line. Uh, I'm going to abbreviate this HA moving forward and vertical asymptotes. I'll abbreviate that VA moving forward. Uh, so let's talk about each uh, one to find HAs. How do we find HAs? All right, so uh, let's talk about horizontal asymptotes uh, given f of x, compute these limits. The limit as x approaches infinity of f of x and the, and the limit as x approaches negative infinity of f of x, which at this point we are very comfortable with limits, of course. Um, so uh, computing that shouldn't be a problem. And then uh, basically, if either of the above limits give a 
constant value. Say K, right? So let's just say you find one of these limits and you get a constant, call that constant K. then y equals k, which is the equation of a line, uh, is uh, NHA. Uh, that's it. You find the limits going to infinity and negative infinity. If you get a constant, y equals that constant is a horizontal asymptote. Otherwise, it has none. Um, Uh, some pro tips note. Um, polynomials don't, polynomials um, that are not um, horizontal lines. don't have HAs, right? A polynomial, if it's, if, unless it's a horizontal line itself, it's not going to have a horizontal asymptote. It's just, it just won't. Um, you can think of uh, a non-horizontal line and take the limit as you go off to infinity, then you're going to either get plus or minus infinity. If you take some like X squared or some other variable, it's going to curve and it's not going to go off to a horizontal. Another thing, um, that can save you some time um, is uh, if f is a rational function, both limits will uh, give the same answer. So you only need to check one. Just kind of distinguish there that I'm not talking about polynomials because if you see it's a polynomial, then you wouldn't even look for an HA in the first place. Um, anything else I want to tell you? Um, this follows from our, um, the, the time when we would get, uh, I don't even know, we didn't call that trick anything. This follows from our uh, bottom heavy trick or our uh, ratio of leading coefficients trick. So remember when the highest power is on the bottom, you're gonna get zero as long as your X value is going off to infinity. So either direction, you'll get zero. Um, if the highest power is the same on the top and the bottom, then it will always go to the ratio of the coefficients, whether you're going to plus infinity or minus infinity. So you'll always get the same answer. Um, otherwise, you'll get plus or minus infinity going in either direction, so it won't apply. Um, yeah, let's do a quick example. Uh, 
suppose f of x equals 1 minus 3x squared over uh, 2x squared plus 4. Find its HAs if it exists, right? Well, uh, here we can know that here, the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x, it's a rational function. I know it's actually gonna give me the same answer as if I approach negative infinity of f of x, it's going to be, what is it going to be? I've been talking for a while, just make sure you guys are alive and hearing me. What is this going to be? Hello, is anyone there? Are you guys hearing me? Yes, I can hear no. you. I'm just okay. thinking. Okay, so do we have a guess? I mean, it shouldn't be taking so long. Um, highest power on the top and bottom are the same. So the limit will go to the ratio of the coefficients. Minus three over two is the answer. Um, that is a constant. And so this means that y equals minus three over two is an HA. That's it. Uh, we took the limit, we got a constant by just looking at the highest powers, because that's what we do with ratios of polynomials, and we make a conclusion based on that. Um, let's talk about vertical asymptotes. These are a little bit more complicated in general, but uh, in this class, I won't ask you most of the complicated uh, situations. Um, very likely, if we do a question where I'm asking about um, where we have to do this, it's either going to be something like, like if I ask you to find asymptotes, it's either going to be a log, a log or an exponential, in which case you know how to find the asymptotes there. Or in the case of a rational function, uh, finding the vert vertical asymptotes. I think I said horizontal asymptotes a little bit earlier. Uh, I'm talking about vertical asymptotes. Um, in the event that it's not one of those guys, then chances are it's going to be, I'm going to give you a rational function. Well, that's the only other thing I would give you. And actually finding vertical asymptotes for rational functions specifically is, uh, is actually not that bad. Um, but I'll tell you what the definition is. Definition. X equals A is a vertical asymptote. Of F of X. If, um, the limit as you approach a from the right of the function is infinite, or the limit as you approach a from the left of the function is infinite. Pretty much you get a vertical asymptote when your graph shoots up or shoots down as you're approaching some specific x value. That's essentially what this definition is saying. Um, figuring out when that happens can be difficult or annoying, um, and so, I will give you a pro tip here. Note, if f of x is a rational function, remember rational functions are ratios of polynomials, then the VA occur 
precisely when f is put in reduced form and we can find x values that make the denominator zero. So you can't divide by zero. Uh, and you don't want to actually have be able to um, reduce, um, you don't want to actually be able to reduce it and get rid of the zero in the denominator, if that makes sense. Because if we can do that, what you get is a whole, not an asymptote. And we've seen that before uh, a couple of times, right? So it's important though that this is, I mentioned that this is put in the reduced form and we find a zero in the denominator. Because if you just see a zero in the denominator in the first place, you can be wrong if you just automatically assume that that is a vertical asymptote. Um, so example, find the vertical asymptotes of the following. So I can have f of x, say it's one over x minus two, and f of x equals x squared minus four over x minus two. If you look in part a, f of x equals one over x min minus two, you'll notice that this is reduced. And you also notice that x equals two makes denominator zero. And so this basically means um, x equals two is a vertical asymptote. And in fact, you kind of know that with this graph actually, because this graph looks like, looks like this. So notice as I'm approaching two from the left, the graph shoots down to negative infinity. As I'm approaching two from the right, the graph shoots up to positive infinity. By definition, that gives us a vertical asymptote. There's a, a vertical line that the graph will continually approach as the y value goes infinite and it will um, never touch it eventually. All right. Um, part B. You'll notice uh, x equals two makes denominator equals zero, but very important, f is not reduced. Reducing, uh, you, you will see that your f of x is equal to x minus two over x plus two divided by x minus two. Those guys can cancel and you get your f of x is equal to x plus two um, if x not equal to two. This gives you a graph that has a hole in it at and that hole is at level four. So no VA, right? Because now uh, denominator here is not going to be zero and you'll never find a finite X value where if you take the limit approaching that value, uh, this will shoot up to infinity. Um, because uh, it's a polynomial, it's, it doesn't have those kind of crazy behaviors. So that second example had no HA because it could be reduced and you can get rid of the problem spots in the denominator. Simplifying doesn't get rid of the problem. It just, it, it can put a hole at the problem as opposed to just like, we can't do anything about this. So we have to completely avoid 
uh, that entire line x equals blah um, because it can't work. Okay, so that's that gives you an asymptote in the first case, but not an asymptote in the second case, uh, based on how the denominator behaves once reduced. Uh, here's another example. Find the H A and V A of this function. Um, 1 over x squared minus 4. Okay. So we go with HAs first, just because. If I take the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x, um, it's a rational function. It's equal to the limit as x approaches negative infinity of f of x. Um, since f is rational, equals, what's this limit? Limit as x goes to plus or minus infinity, what would we get here? You guys need to review your limits. You get zero because it's bottom heavy. Highest power is on the bottom. Um, so this means that y equals zero is an HA. Um, moving on to the VA, um, you would have, well, f of x equals one over x squared minus four which is one over x minus two times x plus two. And it is reduced already. Can't really do anything. Um, so you would set the denominator equals zero. This means x can be two or x can be minus two. And these are both VAs. I can look at this graph. What this basically means is that um, my horizontal asymptote is y equals zero. So the graph will approach this. As my x coordinates uh, go off to infinity, I have some vertical asymptotes. Um, at minus two. And plus two. Yeah, the only problem is I wasn't making the sound. Of course, the iPad. Um, all right, so this is at minus two, this is at two. So those are vertical asymptotes. Um, you will notice that here, um, if I plug in, say, uh, x equals 0, I get minus a quarter. And we also know it has no x-intercepts. Note, numerator cannot be zero. So no x-intercepts. Um, and so I know the graph will never go up uh, it would have to go down because if it went up and it has to approach this, it will actually crash through and create an x-intercept. So the graph has to go down. So the graph is doing this. 
and approaching the asymptotes that way. Um, to figure out what the graph is doing about uh, outside here, I can plug in some test values, say minus three, uh, say plus three and minus three. Um, and then here you'll notice that my F, if I plug in minus three, um, it gives me a positive number. And if I plug in a plus three, it also gives me a positive number. So I know the graph is up here. So the graph has to approach the vertical asymptotes um, and it can't crash through them because uh, it would cause a division by zero, but it also needs to approach zero as it's uh, going along. So the graph will have to do something like this. It cannot touch the x-axis because it's, uh, there are no x-intercepts. So it has to be up top all the time. It can't touch the vertical asymptote and it has to be going towards the horizontal asymptote. So that would be the graph. Uh, so the graph of f of x equals one over x squared minus four is in green. Okay, so that's what we have. So those are the uh, vertical and horizontal asymptotes and how you can find them. Uh, you have to be good with limits. Well, in general, you need to review your limits. All right, know your limits. So the next topic, and I forgot what, uh, let me see. What's the actual section here? Oh, well, uh, I kind of combined three sections in one uh, because they talk about different things in different sections, which I don't think it was necessary. I think you can just do it all in one. I think they mentioned, they spoke about asymptotes in 4.3, if I'm not mistaken, but it's possible they did it in something else. So either way, I think I think it's it's easy enough to do it all at once. So next topic. Uh, this is, it covers sections 4.3, 4.4, and 4.5. It's called curve sketching. Here is where uh, we're going to sketch curves. We're going to learn how to graph curves in more detail than we could in pre-calculus. Now, of course, in real life, you're never gonna be sketching a curve by hand, let's be real. Um, the point of doing this topic is that um, it's proof that you would actually know about some other topics that you should know about. So that is the point. Um, you will be able to, in some tangible way, kind of prove to me that you understand what it means to be an asymptote, what it means to be concave up or concave down. Because sometimes if I, I just ask you to tell me in words, or if I just ask you to just oh, do a calculation and show this, um, the intuition isn't there for what that means and how a graph would behave. So by you creating a graph, even though technically you'll never have to do it in real life, is that it shows me that you understand these concepts and you know how it would how they would manifest. So that leads us to the topic of curve sketching. And let me just move uh, the handouts here. So the entire process of curve sketching is uh, described in this handout that you can find on the class webpage. There we go. Okay. 
So um, here's the process to sketch curves. Um, it's another six step, step process. which we are uh, now going to have memorized. Uh, so the first thing is you want to know the domain of F. You want to know where it exists, where it doesn't exist. Okay. Um, you're going to need to find the X and Y intercepts, usually. Um, I guess occasionally you might not need them, but you very usually, in all likelihood, I'm going to ask you to find the X and Y intercepts um, for a problem. Um, so you're going to find the domain, you're going to find the X and Y intercepts. The next thing you're going to do is find the asymptotes. Um, right there, I gave you another definition uh, for the asymptotes and the, the horizontal asymptotes and the vertical asymptotes, which, which we just went over. So that's step three. You're going to find the horizontal and the vertical asymptotes. Then you're going to find the intervals of increase, decrease, and the locations of maximums and minimums. And remember, you can use the first derivative test to tell you about all of that. So step four is pretty much you're going to do the first derivative test. Um, step five, you're going to find the intervals of concavity and the location of inflection points if they exist. And for that, you can use the concavity test. So we already know about doing that. Um, after that, uh, I'll ask you to sketch the graph. And you're pretty much going to sketch the graph and show that it has all the features that you found in the previous five steps, essentially. Um, and that's that's some that's sort of it. Okay, so um, uh, specifically, I, I would say here uh, you can use the first derivative test. And here, you'd use concavity test. OK. Um, there are some rookie mistakes besides the, uh, the good old, oh, I just wrote down the wrong number, or I just calculated something incorrect. Um, there are times when students would tell me certain things about the graph, but then on their picture, it doesn't show up. Like they would say something like, oh, there are two x-intercepts, but their graph would have three x-intercepts or one x-intercepts. It's like you're not paying attention to yourself. Um, don't do that. That's a rookie mistake. Another rookie mistake is just not cr computing the derivatives directly. Um, make sure that you um, can do that. Uh, another common mistake is just that students aren't sure when to use which function in terms of when to use the original function, when to use the first derivative, when to use the second derivative. I gave you a summary way back. I, I don't even remember where to find that now, to be honest. It was a long time ago. Um, of when to use each derivative. When would you use the first derivative? What it can tell you. I did that whole table where there was a summary. I have to find, uh, yeah. There, there was a point where I gave you that. It, it was a, a long time ago. <laughs> you just have to search through your notes. Um, okay, so make sure you're using the right function. So for example, if you know you're searching for increasing or decreasing maximums and minimums, You'd use the first derivative test to find the x values. You, of course, use the original function to actually find the coordinates. Um, if you're looking for inflection points, points of concavity, you will use the concavity test to find the corresponding x values. You will use the original function to find the coordinates, things of that sort. Right? Obviously, if you're looking for x and y intercepts, you'd use the original function. So you should just know uh, things like that. Right? So make sure you're using the right function for the right thing. Um, let's actually uh, do one example, and we'll do a few more next time. Um, is, yeah, I don't. We'll do one example. We are going to do an easy one. Uh, uh, let's do this.
So this is f of x equals 1 over x squared. Now, of course, we know how to graph this already. Uh, but we want to illustrate the method. Um, with something familiar. So we're going to just uh, graph something easy. We know how to graph it already. We already know what this should look like. Um, but let's see if going through this six-step process, uh, we could actually figure out what that uh, looks like. So let us begin. Uh, so we have 1 over x squared. Let me pull that up on the other screen so I don't forget. Um, which one I'm doing. OK, so uh, 1, I'm going to find the domain. Uh, so we know that uh, that's going to be pretty easy, um, everything except 0. All right, um, 2, x, uh, we're going to find the intercepts. So for the x-intercept, set y equals 0. This means that 1 over x squared equals 0, and you have no solution. Um, no y-intercept. Um, we know it has no solution because uh, a fraction can only be zero if the numerator is zero. And the numerator here is a constant one. It's never going to be zero, no matter what x is. So no y, no x intercept. Um, so our graph should not touch the x axis. Um, as for y intercept, here you're going to set x equals zero. Uh, can't, not in domain. So you also have no y-intercept. All right, moving on to the next thing. We're going to look for asymptotes. Let's do the HA. We're going to find the limit as x approaches infinity of the function, which is going to be the limit as x approaches negative infinity of the function. And this is going to be 0 because it's bottom heavy. So this means that y equals 0 is an HA. Um, you could write f of x here if it is annoying. Write out. Um, so instead of that, you could have written this. Um, Let me ask the approach to infinity of f of x, which is like what I did here, right? So I, I just wrote f of x instead of writing the actual function, which I was looking at. That's OK. Um, just know that when you're saying you're taking the limit of f of x, you're actually take, you know you're taking the limit of that function that uh, you had. So that's the horizontal asymptote, y equals 0. Now, if I look for the vertical asymptote, Um, I'm going to see that f is reduced. So I'm going to set denominator equals 0. Uh, this means that x squared equals 0. This means that x equals 0. So that leaves you with x equals 0 is a vertical asymptote. 
So we've done asymptotes. Move on. Four, uh, we're going to do increasing, decreasing, max, min. So we're going to apply the first derivative test. So if our f is 1 over x squared, this is x to the minus 2. This means that our f prime is minus 2 x to the minus 3, or minus 2 over x cubed. Um, we're going to find the critical points. Um, so this means f prime equals 0 or undefined. And this means that x equals 0 is the only critical point. We're going to put that on a number line. And we're going to test points on either side. Um, so if I plug in this into uh, the derivative, so remember I'm doing the first derivative test here, so I'm plugging into the derivative. If I plug in a negative 1 into the x for in minus 2 over x cubed, uh, negative 1 cubed is negative 1, so I have a negative 2 divided by a negative 1, I would get a positive. If I plug in a one, I would get a negative. What this means is that on this side, it is increasing while on this side, it is decreasing. Um, so what does that make zero? Is there inflection? Sorry. Inflection? No, never mind. Sorry. First derivatives don't tell us about inflections. Um, right here, we're doing increasing, decreasing maximums and minimums. So I know where it's increasing and where it's decreasing. Um, so know that. Here's a max. Because it's increasing, and then at zero, then it's decreasing. Right. So this is not a max. Uh, why? So I know it looks like a max, but it's actually not. Why is it not a max? Isn't it because it's not in our domain? It's not in the domain. That's why step one is important. Um, zero is not attainable for us. So even though zero seems to behave like a max uh, in the first derivative test, it's, it's not a point that we can actually be at um, because it is not in the domain. Remember the uh, first derivative test, go back, review it. I wrote it out. Um, it only hit, is a max if your function is continuous at the point and you're increasing on the left and decreasing on the right. You have to be continuous at the point uh, for that to, to work. Um, so uh, zero, while it almost looks like a max, it's not because it's actually not, it's not even a point at all on the, on the function. So we have that. Um, so we can say it's increasing on negative infinity to zero, and it's decreasing on zero to infinity. And as for max, there are none. As for min, there are none. So that is something we can get from step four. Moving on to step five, here's where we want to do concavity and uh, inflections. So we will go concave up, concave down, or inflections. So here we want to use the second derivative test. So we know that the first derivative is minus 2x to the minus 3. This means that the second derivative is going to be positive 6x to the minus 4, or 6 over x to the fourth. Um, find the critical points. Uh, f double prime equal 0 or undefined. Um, this means that uh, x equals 0 is a critical point. And we are going to test that in the second derivative. 
going to plug uh, a random value on either side, uh, plug it into the second derivative. Notice that the second derivative is a positive number divided by x to the fourth, uh, which means if you plug in any number that's not 0, uh, x to the fourth is going to return a positive number. So this is always positive. And this is positive. So what does positive mean here? That it's above the x-axis? No. The positive in the original function would mean it's above the x-axis. We are looking at the second derivative. Seven concave. Huh? Excuse me? Concave up. Concave up, up like a cup. It means that your graph should shape like a smiley face. Right? It's concave up. Uh, similarly here, concave up. You guys need to review. You're making the rookie mistakes. You're mixing up what each derivative is doing. The second derivative does not tell you the location of the graph, whether it's above or below the x-axis. The original function, f, tells you that. Um, so with this, we have concavity. Now, um, not inflection since concavity does not change, um, would not be an inflection point anyway. Uh, since uh, zero is not in the domain of f. Um, so yeah, uh, zero once again shows up as a critical point, but it's it's not really anything. So now we can move to step six, uh, where we're going to graph the function, and we're only going to graph it based on what uh, we're told. So I like to copy everything um, that was done before on the graph. And I'm going to show you how to do it now. Um, so you have, uh, we know that the domain is does not include 0. We also know that there are no intercepts. Normally, I would put in the intercepts first. So normally, I, first thing I would do is put in uh, intercepts and known coordinates. So if I found a, I found a max coordinate or a min coordinate, I would put plot the points first. Um, second, I would put in the asymptotes. So we know the horizontal is uh, 0 and the vertical is 0. So there is a horizontal asymptote at 0. There's a vertical asymptote at 0. Okay. Next, I'm going to put in uh, intervals of increase. Max inflections. If any. Okay. Now I'm going to put in the intervals of increase, uh, decrease. So I go up and I see that uh, to step four, I'm increasing 
up to zero and I am decreasing after zero. So I can go here and can put those in. I know from, I know from zero going all the way back, I am increasing. And from here all the way forward, I am decreasing. Next, I would put in uh, intervals of concavity. Um, so now I know I'm concave up in both situations. So I will add those here as well. So from here forward, I am concave up. And from here going that way, I am concave up. So now notice that the graph is, uh, all the information that we have is now on the graph. Um, this thing I would do, graph being the above. Now, where do we start the graph? There are a couple ways you could do this. You could start by plugging in a test point, say plug in one um, to have something to go off of. And so you'll know that that would hit uh, one comma one. Um, or you can just kind of also reason through it here. Um, you will know that could the graph be below here? The answer is no, because I would have to approach this as a vertical asymptote, and that would create an x-intercept, which I know is not an x-intercept. So the graph could never really be on the bottom anyway. But if you're not sure, uh, just plug in a test point. Right? So I know the graph is on top. Right? So the graph should be up here. By a similar reasoning, on the other side, I know the graph cannot start down here, because if it did and I had to do that, that's going to create a, 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 an intercept here. Also, if I started down here and did that, and eventually I have to go back to zero, that would have created a minimum here, and I know there is none, right? So this is uh, what I meant earlier by rookie mistakes. Sometimes students just start drawing stuff and then they contradict the things that they mentioned. So none of that can happen. So the graph must be on top. Um, so the graph has to be above here. And it must look like this, by the way. So it's obeying the vertical asymptote and the horizontal asymptote. It has no intercepts. It's concave up everywhere. It's shaped like a smiley face. Um, it is increasing on the left, decreasing on the right. It obeys all the things that I've found. Uh, We're a few minutes over time, but that's it, right? Now, uh, of course, we knew how to graph this before, but I just want to show you that even when we, if we go through the process, we would have figured out how to graph it. Um, it's also worth mentioning that uh, curve sketching is going to be one of the longest processes in this course. Um, it's going to take the most time, so you want to be very, very efficient with this. Knowing the steps in order by heart, knowing how to achieve each step, knowing how to use the derivatives, et cetera, it's going to be very important. So I would say try the rest. Um, so all these problems are problems that uh, can come up on a quiz or a test. On a final, uh, probably a problem like down here would be what I do, final type problems. Um, quiz or test problems. So anything is fair game on a quiz or a test, uh, but for the final, I'll probably give you something like uh, this. Um, yeah, so that's that. Uh, try some more. Uh, try 
Bye for next time. Um, example one, part B. Example two. All. So uh, try those up. Um, and yeah, we will stop there. So that is curve sketching. That's uh, I, I've really told you everything you needed to know. Um, we've been preparing for curve sketching for a while. Um, so not much more to talk about other than going through the steps. So that's it. Uh, hopefully you followed. You guys need to review your limits. And uh, yeah, that is it. Enjoy the rest of your Monday. I will see you guys on Thursday. And so until then, take care. I will see you guys in the next one. Ciao.